All right, thanks for staying with us now. Nation building happens when a society of people, a society of people with diverse origins, history, language, culture, and religion come together within the limits of a sovereign state um, with a unified constitutional and legal dispensation. Now, nation builders are those members of a state who take the initiative to develop the nation community through government programs and can involve the use of um, propaganda or major infrastructure um, development to foster society or social harmony and economic growth. Nation building generally assumes that someone or something is doing the building intentionally and considering um, the state of things in the nation. So today we're asking, what is the state of uh, nation building to you? as a Nigerian, and please let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081 You can also tweet at us at Wayshow Africa one with the hashtag Wayshow. So, Uti, I'll bring in Pastor Ito in a minute. I just want to hear your thoughts. Um, do you think we have that consciousness about nation building as a people, especially as Nigerians? I want to say yes, but then we're also at an interesting time because I think that so much is fighting against what you've just defined as nation building. So from a geographical standpoint, yes, we exist as a country from the different tribes, the different creeds, we all exist within Nigeria. But if you talk about sort of everybody coming together to then build this sort of nation, right? Um, we had an interesting time. We've had uh, when you were sort of reading about nation, talking about nation builders, I, the first thing that came to my mind was the NYC program, you know, bringing people around, that whole mix, taking you away from your home state and, you know, putting you somewhere else mm -hmm. to mix with people and all. So we have, if, if I just take that as an example, we've had some, obviously made some strides into wanting to create that cohesiveness um, as the nation, the Federal Republic of Nigeria, mm. but we're struggling with a lot of things right now. So it'll mm. be interesting to hear um, cool. the thoughts around what the current state of nation, nation. building, because there's, there's so many forces really trying to disrupt that mm. aspect of nation building. Absolutely, absolutely. So Pastor Itwa Egodalo, as you already know, is a pastor, an accountant, a thinker, a social reformer, and a writer. He commenced his professional career in September 1982 at Price Waterhouse, now Price Waterhouse Coopers, and later founded Igodalo and Co, a professional public accounting firm in January of 1987. In October 2007, Igodalo and Co merged with three other firms to form SIAO Nigeria, becoming the fifth largest accounting practice in Nigeria today. He has also sat on various government panels, state and federal, and has been an advisor consultant to government since 1991. He is on the Council of Nigerian British Chambers of Commerce and the M Nigeria Employers Cons Consultative Association and was on the board of the National Council on Privatization. And we're honored to be having him live with us in studio. Yeah, Always looking very humble, a man with many, many powers. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pastor Ito, for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you for inviting me. I mean, there's no how in this nation, Nigeria, that we want to have a conversation around nation, right? Nation building and, you know, um, that your name will not come up in a lot of, you know, a lot of those conversations, not just because of, you know, um, I, you know, I like the professional credential that you carry, but I think it's beyond the profession for you because I've seen you closely and I've seen how much, you know, um, you hold the nation, Nigeria, you know, in your heart. It's something that, you know, from afar, um, People can even sense it from afar. It's not something that is, is hidden, you know. You are always, always putting yourself at the forefront of trying to make sure that, you know, we build a better nation for ourselves as a, you know, as a people. I mean, so having said that, we are a nation, whether we like it or not, Nigeria is a nation. And in your um, assessment, what would you say um, the current state of our country is in terms of, you know, are we really, really going somewhere as a, as a country, as a nation? Well, I wouldn't really say that we're a nation yet. Right. No, we're mm. not. We're aspiring, hopefully, to be a nation. 
for you to come together to be a nation, there must be agreement, there must be understanding, there must be cohesion, and there must be a common vision. And what is really missing in Nigeria is that what's that commonality of the vision that is driving the average Nigerian from Port Harcourt to Zamfara, from Katsina to Yola, from Enugu to Lagos? What brings us together? And what are we all coming together to, to, to pursue? You know, what a lot of people sometimes forget is the historical foundation of Nigeria. And the Bible says that if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Uh, I'm passionate about Nigeria because Nigeria has great potential. Nigeria has great people. Nigeria can be truly outstanding if only we can understand some simple things. Uh, most Nigerians who find themselves in this geographical expression called Nigeria don't understand why they're here. They don't understand how they got here. They just find themselves carrying a green passport and having to go to Abuja to do a few things and then obeying instructions of somebody they call a president. But nobody has that feeling that we must keep Nigeria together, we must drive Nigeria, we have a common goal, we have something we want to achieve. If you talk to any child in America, they'll tell you where the American Americans dream. are, they'll tell you the American dream. For you to get an American passport, you go through a school, you go through tutelage, they train you, they teach you, they give you American history, they tell you what makes an, an American. The question is, what makes a Nigerian? What are the values that a Nigerian holds dear? If you see a Nigerian on the streets of New York, what makes that person a Nigerian? And what will make a Nigerian in Algeria go out of his way to seek another Nigerian in Algeria and make sure that together they survive? Mm. If one American is missing in the Sahara Desert, the whole of America will go after that person. I don't think we have quite the same values in Nigeria because mm. we're forced together by a group of people called the British. They came here, they raped our economy, they took our goods, they took our people, they found economic benefit in Nigeria, and then they forced Nigeria together. They said the southern bride has been prepared for her northern groom. Uh, I have issued the license, and Lord Lugard will preside over the ceremony. Mm -hmm. Nobody had any say. We were forced together. And when we tried to have constitutional conferences to agree on how we'll come together, on the basis of three regions, the military came in 1966 and blew that out of the water, truncated it, forced us out, and forced us in under the barrel of a gun. So all the agitation you are hearing, IPOB, uh, Fulani herdsmen, Hausa Fulani this, the Warrior Besu this, the Yorubas saying they are Feniferi, blah, blah, blah. They are all trying to express themselves and say, I want to have a say in this thing called Nigeria. So as long as you continue to have a Fendi Ferry here, IPOP there, Fulani Hesman here, Mayeti Allah there, Northern this, Northern that, you still will not quite have a Nigeria. You know, <laughs> as you were speaking, I just thought, some of these conversations sometimes, when you start to have them, the situation feels almost hopeless because all of these people have different objectives, they have different goals, they have different dreams. So when you talk about the identity, when you were saying it, the only thing that came to my mind, and it's so sad to be able to, 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 be able to say this, the only thing that connects all of us is money. That's the only language that I can think of when you were speaking that says, so the Nigerian identity now is money, and money is the root of many, many evils, so it kind of explains some of the things that is you said. Is it the love of money, or people? Well, the love of money. It's the money is the love of money that has made it the central factor, isn't mm. it? Um, but it sort of explains the things that yeah. you're talking about. Now, we've had 60 years. So the British arranged the... The marriage. Uh, the the marriage. So it was the arranged marriage that they, they put together. But if I use that same analogy, in the space of an arranged marriage, the bride and the groom eventually find a way to tolerate each other and eventually become friends and, you know, maybe love blossoms out of it. We don't seem to have been able to find that 
here today. And it is even scarier to think that we've, coming out of this last democratic electoral process, it seems like the divide is even Worse. wider, right? So before we even go to solutions, today, how do I, who is responsible? Let me start from that. Who is responsible for giving us an identity, a vision that we can get behind? Because all these groups, with all their varied agendas, agendas dreams, hopes, whatever it is for their people, whose responsibility is it to define the Nigerian identity? Well, it should naturally be the responsibility of the person who has been given the keys to Nigeria under legislature for that period. Mm -hmm. But what has happened is that a lot of people who get the keys to the treasury of Nigeria find that it's to their advantage not to have that conversation so that they can keep looting and raping the treasury. Because what binds Nigeria together is how do we share resources? How do we get to Abuja and then hold the treasury, take our own portion and run with it, okay? Um, so until you find that guy in the center who thinks beyond him or herself, that guy or that lady, who thinks beyond him or herself, who is not there for their own self. Mm -hmm. You know, ask anybody why they are running for president of Nigeria. 90% yeah. of the reason is for them. They want to run. It is their ambition. They want to be in charge. They want to be able to call the shots. They want to decide who becomes petroleum minister, who becomes finance minister. And 90% of the reason is for them. It's not for the small man in Karana Moda that knows no, nobody. Okay? And that is the challenge. So until the various groups in Nigeria come together and everybody is heard and everybody's, um, everybody's desire and reason for being a member of this Nigeria is heard and we all talk about it. Okay, you want to marry me? I want to marry you. Well, how is this marriage going to work? Who are, you know, in Israel, in those days, if you wanted to marry a woman, you will sit with her, her family will sit with their family, they will discuss. This fellow who wants to marry this girl, who is he? Where does he come from? That's where you find Jesse, the son of Obed, mm -hmm. the son of this. Mm -hmm. They do your family history. They do your family history. history. Mm -hmm. Who are you? Then what are you going to become? And what do you have to offer our daughter? Then who is your daughter? Where is she coming from? What does she have to offer our son? Mm -hmm. Then they drop a contract of marriage. That this is the way this marriage is going. That's why you have an espousal of about a year mm -hmm. where the discussions and negotiations mm -hmm. were engaged, but we're discussing. We have not finalized. When we finalize, we will consume it. If we don't finalize, we won't consume it. Mm -hmm. So that you can go and have discussions with somebody else. We're still in night. We haven't even come to the table to discuss. The discussions we had in 1958-59 blew out of the water. Mm -hmm. Everything gone wrong. We said we will operate as regions. You keep your region. I keep my region. You keep Constitutions are different. Pre premiers are different. Then we will share mm -hmm. a bathroom. We will share a car mm -hmm. from time to time. We will share an aircraft. And we will share one megad. So you are all living in a commune. Okay? In an estate, you share a guard, you share one road in, one road out, you share one, if you like, uh, um, refuse disposal dump. Oh. And you all agree how you pay the megad, how you pay the refuse disposal dump, and who is going to manage the megad and the refuse. But in your own house, what you eat, what time your children go to bed, what that's, time they wake oh, up, that's your that's responsibility. Your responsibility. Yeah. You take care of that. Mm. Every month, Bring 20,000 naira to, to pay for the Megad mm -hmm. and, the and all the security and, and all, all this. Yeah. That was our agreement. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden you say, no, 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 no. Um, I will be telling you in your house what you eat. I will even take all the money that you make in your house and be distributing to you what you do. And I say, that's not acceptable to me. That's not the basis on which I agree to enter this relationship. Yeah. But, you know, just hearing you speak, right, I mean, marriage not be by force, right? Mm -hmm. And 
Uti said something that we've had 60 years, and that's the truth. Because every time this conversation comes up and people say, oh, historically we were forced into marriage, right? Two things. First of all, marriage is not by force. If I say I know they do today, I know they do. Because again, maybe the terms of engagement that we agreed on, you are probably going back and you're not fulfilling those terms of engagement, mm. right? Is there a possibility that we can say, okay, you know what, let's have a divorce. We're no longer in, in that. Because again, that's the agitation that is happening in the East currently, where this sit-at-home thing has become really, really, you know, it is so strong. I watched a video of one of their, their strong leaders talking about it, that very soon they will know that, yes, we mean the sit-at-home. And it seems like people are just ignoring it. Like your wife is telling you, I am tired, I'm not feeling this anymore, and all of that. And you are just quiet about it. You're not even saying anything, right? So if tomorrow she's, she decides to probably just pack up and go, there's nothing you can do. So there's, there's the possibility of a divorce that is lurking around the, the corner. Then again, we can't keep on sitting down as a nation and saying that, oh, this thing was forced on us. What are we doing about it? Like, I have so many things I didn't know 10 years back. But I sat down, I studied, I learned, you know. Some of them I failed, but I learned on the job. I picked myself up again. You know, so many things have happened. Some relationship did not work out. But I still decided, you know what, let me try this other way. You know, and as time goes by, you get better, you get mature. But Nigeria is just acting like a toddler. Like, it's, it's like we have not even grown beyond certain things. Like, sometimes when I, when I hear people speak, right, it, it breaks my heart. You said something that the change that we seek, right, when she asked the responsibility of who is to chart that vision. You said that it is the person that is at the center that has a heart. But in this last election that we saw, it was not about the person because even the people, right, we've all become so self-centered that we don't even understand what nation building and it, it, it's about anymore. So everybody is just about what is a need for me. So you could see that a lot of people that supported certain people, it was not because of they actually believed that these people had the vision for Nigeria. No. Now, what did I go for again? You, it, was, it was very clear. So how do we even move from that? Because it seems like right now, like what he said, it's like I feel like hopeless. I feel really hopeless from that. It's a tough one. You know, what really messed Nigeria up was the military. And they cannot put their heads in the sand and pretend as if they did their best for Nigeria. They came with the barrel of a gun and they forced us together. That they forced this thing called Nigeria today. They, 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 the war started, they used superior ammunition, they didn't allow the East to break away with the support of the British and the Americans. Please note that. And they conquered the rest of us with, the, with their gun. And they ruled us with their gun. So everybody kept quiet, you know, mm -hmm. because people were afraid to die. The one or two people that showed up their heads, they got their heads blown off. Ken Sarogiwa is a living example. Mm -hmm. He did nothing wrong. There was nothing constitutional. That can, he didn't kill anybody. He, didn't steal, he just agitated that there must be a more equitable distribution of resource and a better taking care of his region. But the military guy in charge blew his head off and killed him. And nobody spoke. Nobody said anything. So we've been controlled by the barrels of the gun and the vestiges of the barrel of the gun. So when the military finally left, they handed over the gun and the power to whoever was political leader at the time. And that person didn't allow there to be also a conversation because they were afraid uh, and all that. I don't know who's been afraid of Nigeria breaking up, okay? But we should come together and discuss. I think Nigeria, we're better off okay, together. As a matter of fact, on my program, I have the African Leadership Group yeah. program. I have every Thursday at 5 o'clock, Nigerian Leadership Series. It's just to get everybody's opinion. I'm doing my own version of a constitutional conference. I'm getting everybody's opinion as to what do you think? What do you think? What do we do? What do we do? A fellow came and it looked like a joke. He says, Nigeria can even take over Niger. We should take over Togo. We should take over... Uh, Dahomey the, and other, the, bring the them together countries. and we'll have a bigger and better and greater nation. It sounded like a joke, but it sounds like a great thing. If we can all sit together, the bigger, the better. One out of every four or five people of dark skin is a Nigerian. It's an awesome amount of power. Everywhere you go in the world, 
you have these great Nigerians doing great things in the White House, in the House of Assembly in America. If you take a Niger Nigerians out of the medical in Houston, mm. in London, in Maryland, it will collapse mm. because we're so versatile and mm. so strong. But the problem is coming together to discuss, to agree. And what every Nigerian wants is not a big deal. You know, but this thing called oil is so blinded mm. a few people and they're so frightened that if you allow this conversation, some people will run away with the oil and some people will be poor. But that is not correct. Mm. Anybody, it's not physical things that makes money. It's the mind mm -hmm. that makes money. Otherwise, Dubai would not be not where everybody is going. Yeah. What do they have in Dubai? Mm. Nothing. Mm. But they have a bright mind. Singapore will not be where it is if it was the physical thing. Mm. What they have in the north or what they have in the west is even much more than the so-called so oil that oil. they have in Worry and yeah. uh, South South. If we can just take our minds off these things, mm. you know, we'll find that everywhere in Nigeria is blessed. Is actually prosperous. Absolutely. Everywhere. Absolutely. Let's take a yeah, very short break. break, yes. When we come back from that continue the conversation. Stay with us. All right, thanks for staying with us. Now, if you just tuned in, we're discussing nation building, the state of the nation, and we have with us Pastor Itwa Igolalo. Now, please, let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081-8038-4663. You can also tweet at us at Wayshow Africa one with the hashtag Wayshow. Interesting stuff. It is. <laughs> I, I like mean, the idea that, because, again, a lot of people have agitated. We are actually better together. That I've said it that our the, strength is in our the, the um, amount of bitumen we have under mm. this ground in this country, right? We know we do not have any business with potholes, but I just don't understand. Uti, let me come to you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a lot to think about, but I mean, as you're speaking, my mind is just sort of flooding with information. And for me, I'm like, okay, there are a lot of issues. There are a lot of challenges. We are... I think the first time I met you, I said, we have some of the best real estate in the planet. Like the portion that we've been given on, on the globe is so amazing because we have all these resources. And I guess that's what has attracted the British and the Americans to, to come and take from here because there's just so much within the land. But I want to ask about the concept of democracy because some of these places that you've talked about there's a measure of altruism there, but then there's also someone with a vision who is committed to driving the vision and bringing everybody together around the vision. So Dubai is there, um, may not be great in human rights, but they have that vision and that's what they're building towards and that's where they're going. So if I bring that back here to what we are currently doing, which I believe is a system that was also handed to us, the construct of democracy as we have it today, are there alternatives that could help this conversation? Because democracy by its nature, the electoral process, all of that is very divisive. Mm -hmm. So for a country that was already a, a arranged marriage gone wrong with a barrel of a gun added into it, it's already a mess. Then you, know, you add, add democracy the lack of the case. education and sort of awareness and exposure to it, and then you say make a choice. Can we ever make the right choice under the current construct of democracy as it is? It's uh, almost impossible. You know, um, and that's why when I looked up and down, especially <laughs> the last one, I had to go back to God and say, God, you have to help us. You do. You know, Absolutely. all we need in Nigeria actually is one leader yep. who thinks beyond him okay. or herself yep. and who is ready to lead sacrificially. And that Absolutely. will make a world of a difference. But unfortunately, the way we practice it, we have not been blessed with such. And the way our democracy is, is so monetized that unless you really have this money, and for you to make this money, you really have to be sometimes extremely selfish. It's not going to quite, quite work. But the more people like you and myself that speak up, the more people that educate others, the more people that inform others, 
the more knowledgeable people become, then the better Nigeria we will get. Mm -hmm. And what has happened is that our leaders have, um, they have politicized education, they have weaponized poverty, they have weaponized illiteracy, again, again, because they were teleguided. Mm -hmm. The British made sure that we didn't have the kind of leadership that could take us out of where they had put us. They, they, they made sure, and they still consistently do so in African countries. Mm -hmm. They killed Muammar Gaddafi. Mm -hmm. The Americans killed him. Ah. Oh, one of a good leader. He was a and brilliant leader. And the funny thing, right, when I was still young and naive, mm -hmm. before I had, had not gone back to learn about him, yeah. I used to think, because there was one story, you know. There was a lot of propaganda. There was just right? a lot, lot of propaganda. propaganda. They have fed us with mm -hmm. terrible yeah. propaganda. They took uh, this man in uh, Congo Zimbabwe. and they killed him also. You know, he was one of the most brave. They took Kwame Nkrumah, they overthrew him and they killed him. Okay. And so on and so forth. There's, this thing has been going on for a mm. long time. It's time for Africans to wake up and smell the coffee. Mm. So in smelling the coffee, because you, you're actually just leading it right to where I want to probably maybe start to wind down this conversation, media. Because you see that propaganda you're talking about, there's a vehicle for it. You know, the, the, the way the stories are crafted, storytelling, making sure that you begin to see this person as the enemy and this person as, you know, there was a lot of, you know, um, and there's still a lot of, you know, propaganda going on, you know, in the history, in terms of, I mean, things around the African continent in general. So many stories that, you know, when I grew older, to learn, and I found that ah, this thing was a lie. This person was actually a good leader. You know, why did they now paint him like he was the worst thing that happened and mm -hmm. all of that, right? This propaganda is there, you know. So how do we begin to, because again, yes, we're doing our part, educating the minds of people, making sure that we're having the right conversations. But beyond that, uh, you supported one of the major candidates, you know, in the last concluded elections. First of all, why, you know? Um, why did you support him? And also, how do we begin to, um, what's it called now, change the mindset? Because I believe that if we start to have better thinkers, right, people will begin to have more of, um, less of self and more of nation. So how do, we, how do we correct that? How do we begin to start to change that? Even if we might not really succeed, but at least have something there. You know, I'm not a politician. I'm, I wasn't really interested in politics. But running up to the last elections, I began to get a bit worried. Because all of a sudden, we're looking again at the same old, same old. So I went around Nigeria, talking to who I considered leaders in Nigeria. And I said, we need to fix this country. And you guys are in a position to look and select for us and prop up somebody that you think has the right criteria to lead this nation. What is the criteria that we need to lead Nigeria? Number one, visionary, clear vision of where they think Nigeria should be going. Number two, energetic and strong. Number three, selfless. Number four, as untainted as is possible, corruption least or corruption free. Number five, selfless. Number six, caring of the poor. Empathy. Empathy. Number four, number seven is not do or die. The, the person is not, if the person has a second address, they don't, they're not going to die because they're not going to be president, and so on and so forth. So I dropped the criteria. And I looked through the field of people, and I felt that the one who best met the criteria, even though he wasn't the best of the best, but of the 26 that were offered or offered themselves, this is the person I feel best meets this criteria. I'm not saying he's totally corrupt free, but the least corrupt is the one who is energetic and strong, the one who seems to have the most compassion. The, the problems of Nigeria are the same. But who is going to selflessly offer themselves to do the right thing? And the, the, the choice was very, very clear. You know, of all the candidates, I had closer friends in different parties. It wasn't a question of me or friendship. If it was me, I knew who to go with. 
and I'll make a lot of money. But it's not about me and money. It's about how do we make sure every Nigerian makes their own money. And you don't need to know anybody in Nigeria to survive. In Nigeria, if you don't know this, you don't know that, you don't know this, you are just scratching the surface. It's, it, it's time for us to feel for Nigeria, for Nigerians, to be sorry for the average man who doesn't have a voice, to, be, to educate the people. We have epidemic of drugs all over Nigeria. You'll be shocked where they're smoking and drinking and taking both um, medicated drugs and all kinds of drugs. We have an epidemic of illiteracy in Nigeria. We have an epidemic of unemployment in Nigeria. We have an epidemic of poverty in Nigeria. For how long? Maktoum says the job of a leader is to make his people happy. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares who Maktoum is. All they know is that they are happy because he's making them happy. But Gaddafi made his people happy. You didn't pay tax. You were given a house. You were, you, if you married, you were given $5,000. Everybody was happy. Do whatever you want to Gaddafi. Just continue to make sure that we are educated. The man in Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, mm -hmm. the first thing he did was to educate his people. Our people, the last thing they do is to educate okay. us. Mm -hmm. yeah. How is a man going to free himself if he doesn't have basic skills mm -hmm. to free himself? Why our people, they only themselves. They make money, they hide it in a sewer. They make money, they take it to Switzerland, to Dubai, the same Dubai. They take the money everywhere. They don't, they don't think of this. I mean, I've seen people who died, no 2,000 naira. A girl in my church died about 15 years ago because we couldn't find blood. When we found blood, we couldn't find blood bank. Blood bag. Mm. Some nurse in desperation had stolen blood bag mm. and gone to hide it in her house. Oh my God. So at 3 a.m., I was running all over Lagos looking for blood bag. Finally, we found the blood bag. We brought it out. We we're giving blood when the girl died. Totally unnecessary death. Just because some leader who should have paid for blood bag, who should have equipped a hospital, who should. I took the money and put it in their own personal account. Who does that? Who does that? How much money does a man need? Mm -hmm. I'm just coming from the mortuary. I went to see my, my, my in-law, 58. Life ended. How much money? How long are we all going to live for? What are we going to do with all this money? How much money? You know, a friend of mine, you know, he has money, money, money. So he wanted to eat. So they brought him food, small, small food. I said, ah, is this all you're eating? He said, well, pastor, when we were younger, we ate and ate. We didn't have money. Now we have money. You have to eat more yeah. to bring their life. <laughs> well, you know, speaking to, about death, sorry, I mm. you had a question, right? I mean, you have really experienced a lot of people passing on around you, right? Do you think it has also contributed in how... You See, have, yes, you have become, you know, who you are now. Because, I mean, there's a huge, I mean, when, when, when I see you, I see someone that carries a lot of burden. And, you know, like there's something just like you are, you are just there. You know what? I wish this thing can just become different and all of that. Do you think, again, maybe because of the life experiences that you've gone through and all of that, has that been a real major factor in how you are beginning to, you know, go forward, you know, uh, as a person, personally? Well, definitely, but you must understand that I was brought up in the civil service of Western Nigeria. My mother was a permanent secretary. I saw Nigeria government, good government. I saw a Nigeria where a 16-year-old boy could walk to the British Embassy and without no papers demand a visa, and the British consul in Ibadan gave him a visa because Nigeria was so strong. I saw in Nigeria where we lived in a government reservation area. There were no walls, mm. no burglary proof, yeah. no nothing. Everybody moved up and down. If you caught a thief, you stole some tomatoes in the market. Mm. No armed robbers until Oyenusi came. So I saw a great Nigeria. I saw a Nigeria with vision. I saw a Nigeria where people were trying to make Nigeria work. So what happened? So that's my first point. 
Then secondly, I have been through almost everything not so good in Nigeria. I've been through financial loss. I've been through physical loss. I've been through emotional loss. I've been through waste. I've been through accidents. I've been through so many things that has shaped my view. And I've said, you know what? For the rest of my life, I'm going to fight to make sure we have a better Nigeria. Not for me. I'm 62. God help me. Maybe another 25, 30 years maximum. Maybe 100. Who knows? But there are many people out there who need a chance in the sun, who just need a space where they can express themselves and create their craft. There are many. They're so great, so intelligent. If you crack a joke now, before you know it, somebody has sent you Me some words. <laughs> Nigerians are extraordinary. Yeah, Why absolutely. are we holding them down? Mm. You know, we're earning so much from oil. We could earn 50 times that. Uh, what the music industry mm. has done. Just buy. Absolutely. Only. If you go anywhere in the world now, they play Nigerian music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go anywhere in the world, they play Nigerian Nollywood without the help of God. Absolutely. People are using one camera mm. to shoot a film. Mm. And the film is making waves. You can imagine the amount of energy. Imagine if you gave those people better opportunities. Better options. Absolutely. Your guest made mention of understanding in nation building. Also, there should be cooperation. Sister was said that people really do not understand what nation building is all about. The only bother about themselves and the office that they would occupy, they could not be bothered about the masses. That is not um, nation building. To, to be knowledgeable is another form of nation building. Nation building is not only about occupying an office alone. Um, thank you so much, Daniel Elo. Do you have a comment quickly? Yes, yeah, so I've got two. Um, the first one says, ladies, may God bless you for this, your program this night. Pastor, may God bless you abundantly for speaking the truth. Many shy away from speaking. Please, ladies, you can redo this program because it is very informative and educative. It is mind-changing. So this is from Sanctus. Uh, the other message doesn't have a name. It says it's the eastern region that collapsed the regional government into unity government with the change um, if the constitution headed by Professor Wabuze under the leadership of Yorasi after the killings of Northern and Southwest leaders. So our brothers uh, Southeast should tell us what they really want. Okay. Okay. The problem with Southeast is your leaders, is, they don't need to tell you. Your leaders should find a way. If your child is agitated, what do you do? You go and find a way to get to understand what the agitation is about. I think I helped you. Yeah, I did no. it well. I mean. <laughs> you did it well. You did it very well. Thank you yeah, so I'm much. To ask I'm telling you, there's no time. <laughs> right. I'm like, we were just <laughs> lost, but thank you so much, oh Pastor Igo. Ito Igodalo. I know you will definitely come back Please. because you are our daddy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, before we go, ensure you follow us across all social media handles at Waste Your Africa. You can interact with us further, drop a comment, and more importantly, follow all our engagements on social media. Like, share, and invite your families and friends to watch and follow. If you really love the show today, share the link. Right? We need more people informed. Now, if you missed our quote for today, here it is again. If a country is to be corruption-free and become a nation of beautiful minds, I strongly feel there are three key societal members who can make a difference. They are the father, the mother, and the teacher. We'll see you guys tomorrow at 8 p.m. live as we bring another great conversation to your screen. Ciao.